The final segment of our course on two bundle repair deals with the rebuilding of the bundle and return of the bundle to service once it has been rebuilt. Our first step in the rebuilding process is to assemble the framework which will hold the tubes. In other words, assemble the stationary tube sheet with the tie rods, spacers, and baffles. Position them on a channel beam, as shown here. The channel will hold the baffles in position and prevent the entire assembly from twisting or turning as the tubes are installed. The tube sheet itself is supported with wooden blocks and chocks, as you can see. Now measure the length of your new tubes and compare the measurements to the figure you obtained before cutting the tube bundle down. In short, are these new tubes the same length as the old ones you removed earlier? The two measurements should be identical. Don't be misled by the term effective length, which might be given in two bundled specifications. Effective length means the distance between the inside faces of the two tube sheets, not the total length of the tubes. After the framework is in place using the tube guide, new tubes are inserted through the baffles and the stationary tube sheet. The first tube to be installed should be in the lower center of the bundle, as shown here. Then work from that point in either direction, installing tubes alternately on either side of center. This will serve to stabilize the bundle during the rebuilding process. Make sure that each tube is inserted through the proper hole in each of the baffles and in the stationary tube sheet. Position the tubes so that they protrude several inches through the tube sheet, as shown here. Continue doing this until all of the tubes have been installed or stacked, as it is sometimes called, in the bundle. After stacking is complete, Suspend the floating tube sheet properly oriented to receive the stacked tubes. Select four to eight tubes at equal intervals around the bundle. The number will depend on the size of bundle. Then thread these tubes through their corresponding holes in the floating sheet. Ensuring that the selected tubes extend one-eighth of an inch beyond the face of the stationary tube sheet to allow for flaring the tubes. Then flare the ends of the tubes with a flaring pin. This will prevent the tubes from sliding through the face of the tube sheet when we roll these tubes. After flaring the selected tubes, push the remaining tubes back through the stationary sheet into the floating tube sheet to allow space for rolling the selected tubes. Now select the correct size expander for the tubes in this tube bundle and install it in a torque gun. The expander that is used is determined after considering the size and gauge of the tubes and the thickness of the tube sheet. Your plant will normally have reference charts which will enable you to cross-index this information to select the proper tool. Once you have installed the expander in the gun, set the torque and roll the selected tubes in the stationary tube sheet. By rolling these selected tubes, we are reinforcing the framework that holds the entire bundle in place. After they are secure, we are ready to position the floating tube sheet into position on the tubes as shown. Be very careful to maintain that one-eighth of an inch distance between the ends of the tubes and the face of the sheet. Also check to see that the two tube sheets are square with each other. Then flare the ends of the selected tubes as we did before, using a flaring tool or flaring pin. Once this is done, the workman uses the tube expander to roll the selected tubes tightly in place in the floating tube sheet. Here's a very important point to remember when rolling the tubes in the tube sheets. Use the crossover method of rolling. In other words, roll a tube in the bottom, 
and then in the top. Then roll one tube on each side, and so on. This will help keep the tube sheets square with each other during the rolling process. Your instructor can tell you whether or not your plant has set up a definite system for rolling in the tubes, and how it works. Once the stabilizing tubes have been rolled in place, install a plate against the face of the floating tube sheet, as shown here. Clamp it in place with C clamps. Now tap the remainder of the tubes back against the plate. The plate serves as a stop during the positioning of the remainder of the tubes. Check the tubes very carefully once they are in place to ensure that they're positioned correctly with the face of the tube sheet. Then flare the ends of the tubes in the stationary tube sheet with a flaring tool. After all of the tubes have been flared, remove the C-clamps and the plate from the floating tube sheet. The actual rolling of the tubes is something that is best learned through actual experience on the job. You must gain the feel of the tools through use, not by reading about it. However, there are a few tips we want you to keep in mind that will prevent mistakes and save time in the rolling of the tubes. As we mentioned earlier, you must have the correct expander for the tubes to be rolled. If you are using a torque gun, you must also set the torque as specified for the tubes to be rolled. This information will usually be supplied in reference charts. You may find that it is necessary to make minor adjustments to the torque after you have rolled a few tubes, if you find that the roll is unsatisfactory. The adjustment of the expanding tool itself is also very important. Measure the thickness of the tube sheet and set the expanding tool so that it will not roll past the inside edge of the tube sheet. It is recommended that the roll stop at least one-eighth of an inch short of the inside edge of the tube sheet. If you are using a pneumatic drill motor to roll the tubes, like this one, be sure to measure the penetration so that each roll will be the same. Once you have gained experience, you will recognize a good roll by the sound of the pneumatic drill motor itself. Don't forget to oil the expander rollers frequently during the rolling process. The oil will serve to keep the rollers cool and to provide the needed lubrication. Here's a tip on how to tell when a tube is rolled tightly enough. Pour some oil around the outside of the tubes, like this, allowing it to run down between the tubes and the tube sheet. Then, as you expand the tube during rolling, the oil will squirt out. When the oil stops squirting out, the roll should be complete. This method is especially helpful when using a pneumatic drill motor, since there is no positive way of knowing when a tube is properly rolled, as there is with a torque gun. You may also find that it is necessary to roll tubes several times if you are installing them in a very thick tube sheet. This will serve to make the seat more secure. We mentioned a few moments ago that you should use the crossover method when rolling the tubes in the sheet, or, in other words, alternate from one side to the other when rolling them in. The same practice should also be followed when rolling in the remainder of the tubes. This graphic illustration shows the first eight tubes that we rolled in on the stationary tube sheet. To preserve the balance of the tube sheet and tubes, it is considered a good idea to roll tubes in an X on the tube sheet as shown here in green. By doing this, you stabilize the sheet. You would then alternate from one quadrant to the opposite quadrant in rolling in the remainder of the tubes until they are all complete. This is suggested procedure that should work well in most situations. Your plant may have a similar method now in use that works equally well and accomplishes the same objective. Your instructor will fill you in. 
After you complete work on the stationary tube sheet, repeat the procedure on the floating sheet. Flare the tubes with a flaring tool to permit easy entry of the expanding tool. Then roll the tubes following the same procedure we showed you a moment ago for the stationary tube sheet. After all the tubes have been rolled in the tube sheets, you can recheck them for tightness by tapping them with a ball peen hammer, as shown here. If the roll was not good, oil will splatter, and a rattling sound can be heard. You would then have to re-roll any loose tubes. Once you complete the floating tube sheet, the tube bundle will have been rebuilt. All that remains is to pressure test it and return the bundle to service. The pressure testing is performed in the same way shown earlier in the course. Complete the test and have an authorized person verify your findings. Then relieve the pressure on the bundle, disconnect the test pump, and drain the water from the bundle. Once this is done, remove the test plates from both ends of the tube bundle. With the hydrostatic pressure test complete, you would install the bundle on a horizontal boring mill and use the machine to true the gasket surfaces, as the workman is now doing. He would then machine the OD of both the tube sheets if it was required. Your instructor can fill you in on the final step, the procedure for returning a tube bundle to service at your plant. There will usually be some paperwork to be completed and certain people to be notified. Once that is done, don't forget to clean up your tools and your work area. That completes our course on tube bundle repair. As you have seen, it has been quite generalized, designed primarily to familiarize you with general procedures that are followed in the repair of the majority of tube bundles. You will become familiar with the specifics by working with experienced people on the job at your plant. We have some questions for you now on the rebuilding of a tube bundle. You'll find them in exercise number four of your workbook.